Hello and welcome to the Maine Community Foundation's Investment Program 2022 in Review. Uh, we appreciate all the donors and other partners that have joined us here today. It is February 14th, 11 a.m. Uh, I'm Leanna Kingsbury, Director of our Nonprofit Agency Funds. And we're fortunate today to be joined by Deborah Elwood, our president and CEO. So we'll get to share some words with Deborah. Uh, but the bulk of today's program will really be with Brendan Ray, Maine Community Foundation's Vice President of Investments. Um, so we're really going to rely a lot on Brendan's thoughts about what happened in 2022, what worked, um, and how that all contributed to growing the funds that we're managing for you. So we do appreciate all the donors that have joined us. Um, we will be recording the call. So for folks that have listened in later, um, there'll be an ability to um, connect with us and ask questions. But I'm going to share a screen here for a moment just to let you know that during the webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. I'll keep an eye on that. And as the questions come in, I can pass those along to Deborah or Brendan. Um, but of course, after the call, if you have any questions, Brenda and I are always available and our email addresses are, are on the screen. But to get things started, um, I'm going to turn things over to Deborah. I think many of you hopefully have gotten a chance to meet with Deborah Elwood. It's been six months on the job and quite a bit going on. Um, Deborah has been all over the state meeting with donors, meeting with staff, meeting with boards, very busy. And I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to share about what's coming up. So Deborah, Thank you so much, Leanna. It is wonderful to um, be here at the Maine Community Foundation. I was joking with the board at our last board meeting and saying, it's really dark, it's really cold, and it's really quiet, and I'm still really happy to be here. I personally really love winter, but I um, wish we were getting a little bit more real snow and not sort of a mix of snow and ice like we're all getting. But uh, really, really great to be here with all of you today. Um, so uh, while 2022, so we're going to hear, a, you know, the review of the investment program. And of course, while 2022 was a tough year for the markets, uh, there's still a lot of great progress to report on from Maine Community Foundation. So Leanne, you want to start the slides? So in 2022, we have new leadership, first in Brendan, who most of you have met, who is our um, Vice President for Investments. And for those of you who don't know, Brendan came to the foundation with six years in the hedge fund world, and previous to that with four years at um, Cambridge Associates, managing pretty significant portfolios there. Um, and then I came to the foundation as the CEO in July, as, um, as Leanna mentioned. And I came with a fair amount of background in community foundations. I uh, led an organization that um, uh, was supporting community foundations across the country, a national organization called CF Leads. So I come with a fair amount of understanding of community foundations and their complexities worked with hundreds of community foundations from across the country, and really happy to see how well the Maine Community Foundation is operating here in the state of Maine. Um, in addition to uh, this new leadership, we've got the board passed an updated mission, which essentially uh, broadens or kind of acknowledges uh, all of the breadth of partners that the Maine Community Foundation works with and its real attempt to strengthen and build a better Maine. And then finally, the board put a lot of time into um, passing a bold and very forward-looking strategic plan. And it's really, it was exciting for me to see how excited and enthusiastic and engaged the Maine Community Foundation Board is around this strategic plan building off of 40 years of really great work. So next slide, Leanna. So this is, I'm sure you've seen these things, but this is the Maine Community Foundation mission to bring people and resources, and resources of all kinds, together to build a better Maine. 
um, with the vision being that we are a vibrant and equitable place where people and communities thrive. And then you can see the values which we try to live by every single day and are really focused on um, living up to those values. Next slide, Leanna. And so just a really, really brief summary of where the board landed on um, the strategic plan. They really identified three key pillars of work uh, for the organization. One is on strengthening operations and aligning the organization around the mission. So we've been around for 40 years, doing great work, doing some technology upgrades. We're rethinking some communications and we'll be doing and have begun some rebranding this year um, and um, thinking through some of our, our um, grants processing. So um, really doing a lot of good thinking about how to align this entire organization um, around this really important mission. The second area of work is going to be driving greater impact. And this year, we will be doing research, we will be doing focus groups, surveys, uh, and community holding community conversations to help us really understand if there are what issues we might want to lean into as an organization and to use our influence as an organization to really solve um, some of the big problems that the community found, that the community and that Maine is facing. So stay tuned if you, uh, you've, you may have already received a survey, a donor survey. Um, and if you work for a not-for-profit, you might receive a, a survey um, related to not-for-profits. Um, but we're really looking forward to identifying those areas where Maine Community Foundation can really add some value around a particular topic. And then the final area that the board identified in terms of the pillars of work is um, mobilizing philanthropic resources. So once we have a good understanding about what issues might be appropriate for us to take on, um, we see our ability to be able to raise um, resources around those particular issues or to support um, the changing needs of the state of Maine um, and supporting Maine Community Foundation to be able to always be flexible and adaptable in responding to changing needs, just as this organization was with regards to COVID. So that just gives you a little sense of where we are. We've aligned our 2023 budget around this new strategic plan. Um, the management team is really working in close collaboration um, so really excited to be already executing on this really um, helpful strategic plan that the board created. I really want to give a shout out to Greg Collins, who is our um, board chair and all the incredible work that he has been doing to move this organization forward. So that's a real brief um, recap of 2022 from, um, from where I sit, but now I'm going to turn it over to you, Brandon. Thank you, Deborah. I'll actually jump in here real quick before. Oh, Brian sorry, Leanna. Thanks. No problem. I just thought it might be helpful to uh, continue kind of with the thoughts about 2022 and uh, a quick overview of the Community Foundation and what it is that we're doing. So I'll continue to share the screen here um, and we can take a look at um, the various ways that we worked with donors and other nonprofits um, throughout our history at the Community Foundation. And for 2022, you can see the breakdown of the various types of funds. You should look familiar to most of you. Uh, donor advised funds is the biggest piece of the pie there. About over a third of our assets are in funds that we're managing for donors and their families. And um, we certainly appreciate that partnership. And as, as Deborah mentioned, um, donor advised, donor advisors should have received a survey in um, late January. Uh, with an invitation to complete that survey online. And we truly appreciate um, your input and guidance and, and thank all the donors that have completed that survey. It will remain open for a few more weeks, so there's still time to do that. Um, and of course, we really would appreciate the feedback. The, um, oh, I should also add, it will be critical in, in going forward, as Deborah mentioned, some of those impact areas and where we'll align our focus. Um, we'll be looking to donors to help us with that direction. So thank you for that. Uh, 
The other bucket here that I wanted to mention was our nonprofit agency funds. That's the group that I work most closely with, but just shy of 20% of our assets are held in funds that we're managing for other nonprofits on behalf of themselves. Um, so this is important work to us, and it's certainly a, a way that we think we can use some of our resources um, to help other nonprofits in their management of long-term funds. And uh, for our agency fund partners that are listening today, we also are going to look for your advice on, on what we're doing well, what we could do better, uh, and also how we can have some impact going forward at the statewide level. So stay tuned for a survey that should be coming out in March to our agency fund holders. Now, in terms of impact, if we go back and look at 2022, you know, remember the Community Foundation, we're at, at the root of things, a grant-making organization. We're here to make grants and, and we're here to get them back out to the community. And in 2022, we did that to the tune of $59 million um, in grants that we made out to the community. And you can see here, um, the bulk of that came from our donor advisors through their donor advised funds, about 43 million in grants from donor advised funds. And piece of that that we're really pleased to see is the 1.3 million that went out to um, other nonprofits through our Giving Together program. And this has been something that we've, we've done for years, but we really fine tuned more recently. And, and it's an opportunity for donor advisors to review competitive grant pro, uh, proposals that have come into the Community Foundation and fund those proposals through their donor advised funds. Um, so you can see that we had um, 58 different donor advised funds um, contribute towards these proposals in 2022. Uh, that was about, I think, 170 or so proposals. Um, we'd love to see more of that. And I'll put a little um, reminder for our advisors that one of our biggest grant programs, or our biggest, the Community Building Grant Program, will be um, getting the last of its proposals in the door tomorrow. So we expect a whole slew of proposals to be out there on Giving Together for them to review um, in the near future. Rest of the rest of our grant making sources are listed there below. You can see the nearly 5 million that did come from our competitive grant making programs like community building. We're happy to say that we certainly are a statewide organization. We want to reach the state as a whole and, and our community building program has successfully done that with a grant making committee in all 16 counties across the state. And like I said, they'll be starting a lot of their heavy lifting in the coming months as they review all of those proposals. So how does it look from uh, a kind of bigger perspective? Well, if we look at the past five years in terms of grant making history, well, that, that boils down to over 262 million in grants that the Community Foundation has made. Um, again, a lot of that coming from our donor advised funds. But what I think is interesting here uh, is that you can see on this chart, the, the, the blue bar at the bottom are the grants that we've made the purple are the gifts that have been made by um, the, our donors and other nonprofit organizations and added to their funds. And consistently year after year, we see that our grants out the door exceed the gifts that are coming in. That's what we wanna do. We are here to make grants. That's the way we wanna have that community impact. And we wanna make sure that we get that money back out the door. But obviously with more money going out than coming in, that variance has to come from somewhere. And where does it come from? Well, it really is, is good stewardship of the assets and growing them over time. And we do that through good investment management. And this last slide that I'll share with you before turning over to Brendan is just a way of looking at that. This charts the history of the Maine Community Foundation going back to 1993 when we had a $10 donation to get things started and looks through our 40 year history into 2022 when we, when we just reached 675 million. You can see down there at the bottom in blue, that's the grants, that, that's the gifts that we've received, left the grants going out. And that, that big bar on top, the orange, is the cumulative investment return over the past 40 years. Um, so that certainly is one of the strengths that I think we bring to the table. It's not easy work to do. Um, and um, we look to Brendan and the investment committee to really help us out with that process. So I will um, turn things over to you, Brendan, and let you take it from there. Terrific, Leanna. Th thanks, everyone. And, and, um, and thanks, Leanna, and thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. We will um, 
if you can advance that slide one, Leanna, we'll we'll get started and dive um, dive right into to what's going on. Um, so this this graph shows the investment performance of the primary pool portfolio. This is annualized data and un, unaudited at this point, um, as of 12-31-22. The long and short of it is that we, uh, for 2022, the portfolio returned about negative 14%, almost smack dab on top of our policy benchmark, uh, outperforming the 60-40 the portfolio, which here we've represented with the MSCI ACWI, and um, which is 60%, and then the 40 is the, um, the old Lehman Ag, the Bloomberg, uh, the Bloomberg Ag Bond Index. And you can see, um, what the, the only bar that went up last year was inflation. That's CPI, as I'm sure we're all, all familiar with. This also shows the longer term performance of the portfolio. We're the Navy blue bar, um, and you can see the three, five, seven, ten, and since inception mark. So um, although last year was uh, was a, you know obviously was a down year, uh, we're still handily outperforming um, a variety of benchmarks over the long haul. Three years, um, you know, punching in at plus 6.3 since inception at seven, uh, roughly plus 7.7 percent. So, um, again, rough in the rough in the near term, longer term, continuing to uh, to grind out um, our, our benchmark beating returns. Next slide, please, Leanna. This slide is pretty busy, but I, I, I shared it. This comes from our investment consultant, Monticello Associates. I wanted to share it with you uh, to just put some stats up onto the up onto the screen for you. Uh, and and this presentation will be available later, so you can squint at it a little bit harder when you when you have a chance to look at it later. But the long and short of it, it it, it shows the um, you know the annual returns for uh, for the markets, the S and P. In the middle over there, right next to the word December on the top, DEC, you'll see the 2022 is the next column. That's the total return for 2022. And it's a, it's a sea of red ink, not surprisingly, as all the indices were down, the S&P down 18, uh, the ACWI down 18, EFI, which is a, which is a measure of developed non-US markets down, down about 14, emerging markets down almost 20. And really shocking is actually the, the fixed income returns, um, not so much high yield, which has got more volatility, but the, the Bloomberg Ag down 13, that is historically the worst year in the history of, uh, of, the, of the Ag. So uh, just definitely uh, by, by every measure, uh, a, difficult, a difficult year. Next slide, please, Leanna. Um, this, I, for a while I was talking about, this was a year to remember. I'd like to forget it as soon as possible, 2022. The, what's interesting about this graph, this shows the combined performance of the S&P 500 um, with, a, I believe it's a treasury bond index, going back to 1871. And the only reason I, and I promise that this presentation will not all be about um, grumpy bad news, um, but the reason I wanted to show it is to just stress how historically difficult last year was. 2022 is that little red dot down on the bottom. In other words, we haven't seen a year when both equities and bonds just stunk up the joint. There was nowhere, there was nowhere to go. Stocks were down, bonds were down. And as, as you probably are familiar, usually you get one or the other working for you. Um, last year, um, it, it was uh, nothing worked. And you can see the, the, the scatter plot here of the different returns of that combined stock and treasury index. And it is interesting to notice um, 1941, when we went into World War II, and then obviously in the late 60s, there was Woodstock, but also there was runaway inflation, another particularly difficult, uh, particularly difficult time. So you don't have to get the exact details. Just remember, uh, historically bad year. Let's let's forget it and get to 2023 as fast as possible. Oh, but before we do, um, this is this is showing 150 years of the performance of a 60/40 blend portfolio. And you can see those red bars. Again, 2022 hanging right in there is one of the worst in history. So just another illustration of um, how historically challenging it was last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. This slide um, is a, represents our asset allocation. That's the way that we divide up the, the pie, if you will, of the different kinds of assets that we are invested in. On the right-hand side, we show the target allocation. This is exactly as the name implies. These are the targets to which the portfolio is strategically always aiming at. 
the the big half moon on the right hand side that's listed global equity that's publicly traded stocks the orange uh, quarter pie there is marketable alternatives that's kind of a fancy name a catch-all name for mostly what we popularly refer to as hedge funds so different kinds of investment vehicles that um, have the ability to go long and short and do a number of other different things the gray slice of pizza there that's our private equity and venture capital target allocation and then the uh, the light blue is our cash and and fixed income allocation and note that we we have a zero percent target to real assets although in actuality on the left hand side this shows how the pie is divided up as of the end of december last year our listed global equity those are our publicly traded stocks all over the world uh, at about 44 percent our marketable alternatives our hedge funds a little bit over target at 26 Private equity and venture capital substantially heavier than our uh, than our target at 17. We actually do have a sliver of real assets in the portfolio, some real estate as well as some natural resources. Happy to talk about that later. They're in funds that are uh, that are running out, so but we still have them, so they're part of the official investment of the portfolio. And then our cash and fixed income at 11%. So target on the right hand side, that's the platonic ideal, if you will. The left-hand side is uh, is actually where we are set up. Next slide, please, Leanna. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to give you uh, uh, just a quick overview of some adjustments that we made in 2021, 2022, and it, it might be helpful at this point just to remind everyone that um, that I, I, I'm the internal staff member in charge of of running the portfolio and thinking about our investments. We also work with an investment consultant, Monticello Associates, an institutional investment consultant with, with clients all over the United States, including many community foundations. And then we also have an investment committee. That investment committee meets, uh, scheduled to meet four times a year. It can and does meet more often as situation requires. So I wanted to um, give you that context to say, it's not, it's not just me back here, you know, calling up my broker, if you will, and saying, hey, let's do this or that. It's a it's a, a combined think tank um, type of effort. And with a portfolio this big, again, you may be uh, probably familiar, there's not a lot of big sudden moves to the portfolio. It's not like in trading places where it's, you know, sell orange juice and buy pork bellies or what have you. It's not that kind of, that, um, that sort of near term kind of um, pulling on different sorts of levers. So let's review really quickly. Before I arrived on March 1st, in late 2021, early 2022, the investment committee had made several asset allocations decisions. Uh, asset allocation decisions that proved to be um, to proved to be very effective for for last year. The first one was being significantly underweight bonds. Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, the bond market had one of the worst, if not the worst, years ever. So the good news was um, the bad news was we still lost money on the bonds that we did own. The good news was we didn't own very much of them. So good news on a relative basis, we were underweight bonds. We maintained a lot of cash. Bad news is cash really didn't earn you very much and hasn't for many, many years. Um, good news is you didn't lose very much either. Um, so you, good for, that was a very solid decision. And we maintained our target weight in marketable alternatives. Those are the hedge funds that I referenced earlier. And, and the reason um, that proved to be a very, a very uh, positive, a very good decision, because hedge funds um, in down drafting markets um, tend to be your anchor to windward, so to speak. They tend, and, and in fact, that's exactly what happened in this past year. They gave us a lot of lift as the rest of the portfolio was um, uh, was was being compressed downward. So that that led into the year, and then during 2022, we did a number of uh, different things as we were maneuvering. Um, we decreased our China exposure. That was actually effective at the very back half of the year. And that's a combination of things. You may know that Chinese equity markets got uh, absolutely smoked um, in 2022. It wasn't a reaction so much to that as it was to some larger geopolitical um, and strategic concerns that we have about China. So we, we still have exposure to China, but we decreased our, our specific uh, China specific exposure. We right sized some of our global public equity positions, positions where they had gotten a little chunky, a little bit large or a little bit small. So um, it was about really moving money around inside the portfolio. Um, during Q4, as the market had sold off through a good part of the year, 
during the at the very end of Q3 and early Q4, we began we began averaging back into equity, adding money to uh, to the equity portfolio, spread across some different sorts of managers, but we averaged in. And at the very end of the year, we actually added to fixed income. You remember I mentioned at the beginning we were underweight fixed income. We're not overweight, but we wanted to make sure that we were capturing some of the benefits of increased yields as rates have been as rates have been rising. So moving some of the money out of that robust cash balance that we had and moving it into some uh, pretty short and ultra short um, duration, that, that's a pretty nice place to be with the yield curve uh, right now. But in any case, to pick up a little bit more yield in the portfolio. So um, a few things that we did in 2022. Next slide, please, Leanna. Um, this slide shows the performance by asset class, performance of the portfolio by asset class. You can see for one year, total portfolio down 14% and those other data going out three, five and 10 years. The listed global equity part of our portfolio, that's our publicly traded stocks um, worldwide, down about 24 and a half percent. Um, definitely the more, a more frustrating part of our, of our portfolio for the year. Over the long haul has, has certainly put up fine numbers, but that was the real, um, the real standout last year. Um, marketable alternatives, that's our hedge fund book. We're only up 40 basis points for the year, but up, up 40 in a down year like last year, that's, that's the new black, that's the new up 10. I'll, I was uh, really happy that we managed to have a positive return on the, on the hedge fund side of the book, which really gave us a little bit of uh, lift as the, uh, as, the port, as the markets were, were racing to the bottom. Private equity book down about 14%. Um, I, I won't talk about the details about how private equity investments are marked because there's a little bit of a lag. I can talk about that in Q&A if anyone's interested or happy to talk about it, um, talk about it offline. But for now, down 14% for the year. And there's our cash and fixed income book. Remember, being underweight fixed income was a, was a huge benefit for us last year. Um, the, Bar uh, the Barclays, I'm sorry, not the Barclays, the Bloomberg Ag used to be the Barclays, the Bloomberg Ag down 13 and our cash and fixed income book down about uh, four and change. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty happy about how we um, managed to uh, control the damage there. Uh, and you can see the rest of the results. I will say really quickly about the private equity venture book. I mean, look at the three, five and 10 year numbers. That asset class has just been on fire for a long time. Um, obviously, last year um, got punished and um, and we'll see, we'll see what 2023 brings, but absolutely had been a major contributor to the portfolio for the previous decade. Next slide, please, Leanna. So here I just wanted to highlight, um, moving away from some of the data and charts and graphs, I wanted to highlight a, a few high level, um, a few high level concepts, the things that, um, that govern the way that we, the way that we think about the world. Our investment objective is to achieve the highest risk-adjusted returns over longer periods of time. Risk-adjusted is particularly important there. Um, our mix of investments, we're looking to uh, achieve about 5% net of inflation. Um, and that inflation number, is, uh, as, as we're all familiar from last year, has become especially an important consideration. And I wanted to mention very quickly, um, uh, talk a little bit about risk. There are two kinds of risk. Um, and those of you who have been on these calls have heard me talk about this uh, talk about this in the past. There's at least two kinds of risk. One is the short-term fluctuations in the value of investments. That's that's called volatility. That's totally normal. And um, and last year we're experiencing, unfortunately, downside volatility. It's going the direction we don't like. But but this is this is near term. Um, one year in the in the larger scheme of things is uh, is a is a small blip. Um, the bigger and I think more important species of risk is longer term risk of permanent loss of capital. You know, if, if, if you give me $100 and, and I go and I lose that $100, you never get a nickel of it back. That's what we're trying to um, fundamentally avoid the permanent loss of capital. How do we do that? First of all, we do that with due diligence of our investment managers. Um, these are all, all of the managers that we're invested with are high quality, long track record, institutional quality managers that have been around. So um, uh, been around for a while and have been compounding capital for their clients for a long time. So there's a due diligence part of thing, not just on the investment side, but on the business side. Are these businesses that are secure and stable and, um, and that are constantly concerned about risk, both to their business and to the investments. And then we also manage risk, and this goes to the volatility question, we manage it by diversification. That gets back to the 
asset allocation pie that I was talking about earlier, where we are, we are globally invested, we are invested all over the world, and we are invested in different asset classes. So yes, we are invested in quote unquote stocks and bonds, um, but we also have hedge funds and private equity investments and private credit investments and other sorts of things that distribute the volatility um, across the waterfront, so to speak. Brianna, mm, thank you. Uh, this slide shows our comparative performance against a group of, this is a collection of endowments and foundations, not necessarily community foundations, but endowments and foundations. That's kind of the broader ecosystem in which we, uh, in which we live as a foundation. And you can see um, main CF, where the blue bar there, and you can see how we stack up one, one through 20 years. Last year, um, definitely not hitting the ball as well as, uh, as our peers. Um, it looks like the average for, um, uh, for ENFs, this is over $500 million in size. So, and there's some, there's some, certainly some bigger, bigger whales in that pool, but the long and short of it is we're down 14. That group um, averaged out around down 13 and change. So underperforming that group over the long haul, easily outperforming a group of our peers over three, five, 10, and 20 years. Leanna. <clears throat> This slide is actually specific to community foundations. Um, this shows our performance versus 56 community foundations in the United States as of 1231. These community foundations all over 100 million. So there's, there's some in here definitely that are a little smaller, smaller than us uh, as we're in the mid 600s. And um, so a little bit smaller than us, which, which might skew things just a little bit, but you can see how we are. This is the data are from the Council on Foundations. And you can see that there we are again at our, I hate to say this negative 14, that's a new, I'd like to change that number eventually, but there we are, negative 14 for last year. Um, the, the average for community foundations a little bit, a little bit worse than that at negative 14.4. And you can see again over the long haul against a, a peer group of community foundations, we've easily, um, we've easily outperformed our peers over, um, over three, five, seven, 10, 15, and 20 year uh, time periods. I wanted to provide everyone with an update on responsible investing. This is something I've talked about on our, our last few calls. I know that, and I've spoken with many of, with many of you that are listening today and, and are not listening, maybe listening to the replay, to talk a little bit about, we, we've talked about this topic in, in, a, in a bunch of different kinds of contexts. So an update on where we are with our responsible investing efforts. Um, first thing, uh, and this is, this is old news at this point, but, we passed a statement of responsible investing a little bit after I joined. Uh, we did this in Q2 of 2022. So I believe it was in May that we passed the statement of responsible investing. Um, we regularly do this, but at the end of the year, we completed a review of all of our current investment managers uh, to, to assess the, our portfolio's ESG awareness, the character of, of where we are with how ESG is being, is suffusing across the, uh, our portfolio. 90% uh, and the, the answer to that, that, if you put that as a question, the answer is 90% of our active managers have an ESG policy. And this is, this is an increase from 72% in Q3 uh, of last year. And 100% of our active managers have either integrated ESG factors into their process, which means that portfolio decisions are fundamentally driven by ESG factors, or they consider them which means that uh, ESG factors may not be required for an investment, but they are part of what's going on with the investment process. So happy to see that we've made, uh, we've made progress there. That is our commitment and, um, and, and, that, and that will continue. Well, now we come to the outlook for 2023 and um, there's gonna be a few market, some detailed market related slides that are gonna come up in a minute. They're, they're unfortunately, the kinds of slides you have to squint at a little bit, but I will try to try to do a good job of summarizing. Um, our outlook for 2023, January, by the way, we had a terrific month in January. All of our asset classes outperformed. Most of our managers outperformed their benchmarks, just crushed the ball to all fields and for power. Um, in, in January. So really, really pleased about that. Despite that, we remain cautiously pessimistic. Um, we are, we remain a little bit underweight public equities. Remember I talked about the target and the actual, we're still slightly underweight public equities. At, at the end of, um, 
at the end of January, we're about 4%, about 4.5% underweight our public equity target. Uh, we remain fully invested and actually slightly overweight invested in marketable alternatives. Those are our hedge funds. That's our where we that's our anchor to windward in, in bad times. Um, and we did we did rotate some of our cash into some short duration um, fixed income to pick up uh, to pick up a little bit of yield uh, going forward. Just yesterday, I was reading a really fascinating article, um, and the article uh, elaborated on three views from three very reputable. Let's assume very, you know, very reputable, smart organizations with their views, their outlooks for 2023. One view, and they're all logically internally consistent with data, et cetera, et cetera. One view says the markets are going to be up 10 to 15 percent this year. I hope that's right. Believe me. Another view uh, had the markets vacillating between down three and up three, and finishing the year negative. And another view um, had the markets down 10 to 15 percent. That's the, you know, the sky is falling sort of view. And I and I only put that here not to say uh, this one is right or that one is that one is wrong, but just to say that the data are contradictory, contradictory and difficult. The consensus is all over the map about what 2023 is going to look like. Um, and um, and again, reputable, intelligent people looking at all this stuff, coming up with three pretty different versions. We are cautiously pessimistic. If we're wrong, and I would love to be wrong, I would love for the markets to rally this year, the economy to, to be in just wonderful condition, and everyone can point their finger and laugh at me and say, you know, what a knucklehead, boy. But I would much rather err on the side of being a little bit pessimistic and a little bit defensive here. Again, as we think about um, safeguarding and stewarding the capital that you've entrusted to us, I want to err on the side of and the investment kitty wants to err on the side of being a little bit defensive and a little bit pessimistic. And let me give you just a little bit of data for, for some of that cautious um, pessimism. Next slide, please, Leanna. These are, um, there are slides here, again, that will be better, in many ways, better to look at later. But what this slide shows is that um, our, the, the average PE ratio on the S&P 500 is still pretty high compared to its historical average. And the average 10-year Treasury yield where we are today is still a little bit low. Um, and this just suggests that, um, that we've got more contractions uh, are certainly possible on the equity market side um, with more contractions also on the, on the bond market side. So you can see that equity valuations typically contract when we get when we're in or near the bottoms of a bear market, which is where we are. And um, the historical average PE tends to be lower than where it is, and the yield tends to be higher. Um, although there have been cases where that is not the case. So again, the data are difficult to say it's always like this and always like that. But one 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 reason for some cautious pessimism is illustrated on this slide. Next slide, please, Leanna. This gets to um, a similar sort of phenomenon um, that, again, another reason for, um, for some cautious pessimism this year. Energy earnings were positive in 2022. Most of the rest of the S&P 500 index would have reported a decline in earnings, uh, earnings growth uh, last year. You can see the second sentence there. Three negative, three, down three, three, down four, and down five for the first, second, and third quarters. Uh, energy is expected to be the largest contributor for Q4 of last year, um, and all that. What, what all that means is that as you know, as er, as earnings decline, typically stock prices follow earnings. It's it's a there's a there's a pretty simple relationship, and so we're concerned about further contractions in earning growth in in earnings growth. Excuse me, in 2023. Um, the, the last thing is that there is a um, there is a, a, a an index called the ISM Manufacturing Index, which entered um, I don't know where they got this vocabulary word, but contractionary territory in December. It was going the wrong direction, uh, and there's been a very uh, consistent correlation between manufacturing activity and earnings revisions. So um, again, just a, a few more data points for some cautious pessimism. Next slide, please, Leanna. This is um, the, um, there's a, again, a few data points here about whether or not we will have, uh, 
you know, what, what the risk of recession happens to be. Um, that we've had an inverted yield curve for quite a while that typically it's, it's uh, it, in mid December, the inversion got to the, its deepest inversion of the last 40 years, which is non-trivial. Um, and typically when you have an inverted yield curve, it's a, it's a predictor of some kind of recession. We'll see if that, uh, we'll see if that happens. The, there was an exception to the rule. The only exception was in the third quarter of 1996, um, when uh, when we did not go into recession and basically, you know, economic and, and earnings slowdowns that happened. So again, we'll see where that uh, we'll see where that lands. The, um, another point here on the right hand side, the senior loan officer survey, which shows the willingness of banks to lend money, uh, and that data has turned negative. So not a, also not a not a good sign. So. Um, I think I have one more uh, one more slide about my my grumpiness. Um, this is uh, there are just several several um, the conference board's leading economic index puts together several indicators about the uh, about the economy and um, on a year over year basis this index has contracted by six percent six percent which has tended to be a pretty accurate um, predictor of recession. So. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Let's see, Leanna, can you go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, why stop? The, um, the last slide, I wanted to take it a little bit out of the United States and, and just show you a slide about, uh, about global growth and some expectations. Again, these are forecasts for GDP growth. On the left-hand side is 2022 real GDP growth forecast, and you can see the bars there, all, all, all positive GDP growth, except for Russia down in the, down in the very bottom. But on the right-hand side, you can see the bars. Even if you just look at it, you can see that the bars get smaller on the right-hand side. That's the 2023 GDP growth forecast. And you can see that the forecasts there are for, um, for GDP growth to, to, to slow, to shrink a little bit. Um, again, just another, another um, indication of global economic uh, contraction as opposed to expansion. Next slide, please. And this look at the the um, and and um, I've dwelled a little bit on some of the data points for for why we're being cautious <clears throat> uh, at the present time, but it, at some bigger level, uh, I don't want you to take too much away from from an outlook on 2023 or for the near time, because it, it matters and it's important. But at another level, it's not so much. The point is that we are and we will remain. We this is our business. We are a long-term, vigilant, diversified investor. Um, and let me emphasize all three of those terms. Long-term, we are in this for the long game. We worry about this 24-7. Um, and we are, we are diversified all over the globe. So we're distributing our risk. And we are about safeguarding and growing the assets that you've entrusted to us. So um, I know I'm a little grumpy on 2023 and 2022 is was um, was was certainly a challenging year, uh, but the long-term picture remains as robust um, a, a, as it always has, and, and that's what we're in it for. Next slide, please, Leanna, if there is one. I'm trying to remember. Conclude, that's my conclusion. It means there probably isn't much coming. Oh, thank you. How about that? Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We would, we would very much appreciate your feedback. I'm always available. Feel free to pick up the phone call, shoot me an email. Um, come right down here to, uh, to Ellsworth and we'll get a cup of coffee. Always happy to talk about investments, about the portfolio, what we're thinking. And, um, uh, and, and thank, just thank you very much for, for your support and your commitment uh, to the foundation uh, and to the great state of Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. I, I uh, don't see any questions in the Q&A right now, but I think that was a lot to digest. So I hope folks will take a minute to uh, to think about that and know that, of course, you can reach out to Brendan or myself anytime. Um, as mentioned, we are going to put a recording of this call on our website later this week, along with the presentation slides. So there was a lot in there, meaty good information. And I think having this, the, uh, a printout of the slides or being able to look at those later on will be helpful. So um, unless, Deborah, if you have any final words or, or, or sign off notes, I think we are good for today. Um, I hope everybody enjoys um, a little bit of a warm up here in the middle of a main winter. Um, and we certainly appreciate you joining us this morning. Thanks.
Thank you, everyone.